Good morning. Welcome to Grand Rounds. Uh, I'm Susan Vogelmeyer. I'm one of the basic scientist uh, psychiatrists in the department uh, and head of the research resident training program. I'm very happy to introduce Anne Malofsky uh, to give Grand Rounds this morning. Uh, I'd like to say that Anna is homegrown talent, having gone through our uh, research track. Uh, I'd like to say that, but in fact, she was quite talented when she came here already. She did an MD-PhD uh, at Michigan with Sean Morrison. Uh, she did some fundamental work in uh, stem cell biology there. The first two of her now three nature papers were about factors that uh, control or associated with the balance between uh, cell proliferation and senescence. Uh, and she discovered or identified a molecule that is still used today as the standard way to identify uh, stem cells postnatally. Uh, she brought the the, that thought pattern from another field here to neuroscience, um, looking at the self-renewing cells in the brain, glia, which are relatively understudied um, given their importance in the brain uh, in our neurocentric universe, I guess. Um, she, she used um, procedures that she had kind of uh, used in the stem cell world to look at expression profiling of um, regional astrocytes, found that different astrocytes from different regions of the brain actually express different proteins and they uh, work differently. And therefore, a, an astrocyte from, say, frontal cortex uh, is able to grow frontal cortical neurons better than an astrocyte from, say, the spinal cord. And in fact, in the spinal cord, the dorsal uh, astrocytes grow dorsal neurons better than the ventral uh, astrocytes. And that is really important for CNS repair, for synaptogenesis, uh, for neural positioning, as circuit maintenance. Uh, and then she's applied the same kind of um, ideas to the developing brain and has found, uh, looking at expression profiling of developing astrocytes, some interesting uh, immune molecules. And um, her husband is an immunologist, so she had a, uh, a reason to really be uh, um, piqued by this molecule. And uh, she's going to talk to us today about her second of two science papers, uh, about how this molecule might be important in uh, synaptic pruning and synapse development. So welcome, Anna. Thanks so much, Susan. I have to learn to introduce people like that. Um, OK. Can everybody hear me? All right, so I'm very happy to be giving grand rounds. Thanks to everybody that's here. Um, I will be talking about some of my basic science work and my lab, which is at Mission Bay. Um, I don't know if this is the usual format for grand rounds, but I'd be happy to take questions in the middle or anytime anyone is wondering and make it more of a conversation if possible. Um, I know this stuff can sometimes feel very distant from the clinic, and I will do my best to you know, see if I can point out some of the overlaps. So today I'm going to talk about something that my lab has started working on. Since I started my group, it was not what I was trained in, but it's been really exciting and fun to learn a new field. Um, brain development in the immune system. So how does the immune system affect the developing brain, and how can understanding the immune system help us understand how synapses form? And the big picture, I mean, what my lab is really interested in is understanding how early experiences shape the brain. Um, in my clinical life, I'm a psychotherapist, and so this is something we think about all the time. Um, and it's very clear to all of us that um, experiences early in life affect how our brain functions in adulthood. Um, for most neuroscientists, this has taken the form of studying um, visual cortex and how um, if the eyes are not properly aligned at birth, the way that the cortex develops will permanently impair how you can see vision later in life. Um, depth perception and so forth. Um, but we know that cognitive development also depends on early experiences and early environmental enrichment. And most importantly for the work that we do, at least from my perspective, um, early attachments, especially before the age of two, determine lifelong patterns of um, attachment and 
emotional stability and so forth. So all of these are examples of early experiences that can shape how the brain functions in adulthood. Um, but ultimately this has to come down to a cellular and molecular process that's happening and that's what we're interested in understanding. So three main points I want to make today. Um, synapses, the connections between neurons in the brain, are very dynamic and they're constantly turning over during brain development and when we learn. Um, the immune system is involved in psychiatric diseases and I think one of the major points of confusion or what I really want to um, emphasize is that it can be good, it can be bad, um, but it's necessary for brain development. Um, and finally, Glial cells, which are the cells that my lab is most interested in, as Susan said, um, are communication hubs between the immune system and the brain. So there has to be a way that the information from immune cues, from whatever's going on in your periphery, is communicated to the neurons in the brain, and glia are sort of the linchpin in that process. So first I want to talk about synapses and talk a little bit more about how we think about synapse numbers and synapse turnover. So um, I used to talk to Dan Mathelon about this a lot, I don't know if he's here, um, but there's a lot of interest in understanding how synapses are um, developing over early life and how many are there and when are there more, when are there fewer. Um, there's famous studies by this fellow Hootenlocker um, where they've counted synapses in what now would be considered a fairly old fashioned way but it kind of works. Here's a one micron scale bar. This is about a half a micron. That's about how big a synapse is. Um, and basically found that um, the number of synapses peaks in early infancy. So this is days after birth. Um, the red line indicates birth. Um, and this is the percent maximum number of synapses that you'll have in terms of synapse density. And it seems like there's the most between zero and age three, and then there's this adolescent phase of falling off. Um, and so this has led to a lot of thinking about, um, this is very careful quantitative data, a lot of thinking about how these changes in synapse numbers might be correlated to the diseases that we see, um, in particular autism, which tends to manifest in the early years of life, and schizophrenia, which the symptoms tend to present um, at the onset of adolescence or a little bit later, depending if you're male or female. So, um, you know, one hypothesis that could come from this is that in autism you're having too exuberant formation of synapses and in schizophrenia you're having over pruning. And so for many years this over pruning, well, still, the over pruning hypothesis of schizophrenia um, has been um, popular and the major theory for how we understand what might underlie the pathogenesis of schizophrenia. In other words, that too many synapses are taken away at this critical period in brain development. Um, but I often think about, this is something I, um, my graduate mentor first pointed out to me, um, what are we not seeing when we look at data like that? So here's an example graph of something that was discovered about HIV when I was a graduate student. And you can see time on the x-axis, number of T-cells on the y-axis, and everybody knew that the number of T-cells after the initial infection stays steady for a long time, and then it starts to drop, 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 and when it crosses a critical threshold, um, you have AIDS, and that's when you get disease. Um, and this fellow named um, David Ho, um, and I think this is in 1995, discovered that what looks linear and smooth and simple is actually a very dynamic process where T cells are furiously regenerating themselves, the virus is furiously replicating, the inflammatory response kicks in to make more T cells, and it's only when this process is exhausted that you see disease. So it's not just a simple drop off, but there's something going on all the time. Um, people often ask me, you know, how my work is clinically relevant, and I would say that at this stage where we are in um, understanding the brain, it's not uh, practically clinically relevant, but I think thinking about things like this um, can have a huge impact in how we approach our patients. If we think about the brain of a schizophrenic in the prodromal phase as desperately trying to heal itself, um, it might give us um, more impetus to really try to tackle these processes that are um, eventually failing to sustain brain function.
So what are the variables that we're not thinking about when we think about synapses in the brain? Well, first of all, that graph that I showed you is a graph of synapse density. Um, but the brain is growing pretty dramatically in the early postnatal period. This is um, MRI study from the NIH, one week, three years of life. So if the brain is tripled in size, we know that even if synapse density is not changing that much, there are three times as many synapses. And secondly, we know that every time we learn, new synapses are formed and removed. So this is just one example of many, many examples where people have started putting two photon microscopes right on the skull of a mouse, making them learn. Here they're learning how to run really fast on a rod without falling off, poor things. <laughs> it speeds up really quickly, so it's amazing that they stay on. Um, and you can see here, these are dendritic spines, so it's one dendrite of a neuron, and these are the spines, which is the postsynaptic part of a synapse. You can see spines being born by two days after they've learned this task. So synapses are there, they're turning over, they're increasing in number, and they're changing all the time. And yet, yet, most neuroscientists like to think of synapse formation, this is a, like a stock photo, um, as neurons just sort of stretched out in empty space, like David and the Sistine Chapel, not David, is Adam? Adam and God in the Sistine Chapel. If the synapse wants to change its synaptic partners, it just reaches over here and it's all very easy. But that's not how the brain actually works and that's because the cells that I'm most interested in, the glial cells, are filling up every nook and cranny of the brain. So there is no empty space in this brain. Um, synapses, in order to form and reform, have to take away what's already there. So this is a constant churning and turning over of synapses. Um, and synapse remodeling um, is required to make space for these new connections. Which leads us to the third variable that we're not thinking about when we think about synapse numbers, that there's not any empty space. So this is an image from Jeff Lickman, who spent like, you know, five years or I don't know how long reconstructing one millimeter of mouse brain to make the point, all these different colors are either bits of neurons or bits of glia, to make the point that there's not a lot of empty space in the brain. So. To summarize the first part, synapses are very dynamic and they're constantly remodeling. And so we need a conceptual model for understanding how does a tissue turn over in a dynamic way? How does one cell talk to the other cell to say there's too much of you, there's not enough of me? How is this communication happening? So in the next part, I want to talk a little bit about the immune system and why this became so interesting to me in understanding the central problem. Um, so. One way to think about tissue remodeling um, is from the perspective of innate immunity. So people tend to think of the immune system as what fights off invaders. Um, we have the adaptive immune system, which is um, antibody mediated and specific to a target, which is how vaccines are developed and so forth. And we have the innate immune system, which is the first line of defense. So viruses and pretty much anything that the body doesn't like or is not healthy is attacked by the innate immune system. But it's actually the innate immune system is a very ancient system, which was probably evolved to help cells in the body talk to one another. So you can see that the brain, and one important point here is that the brain is just a tissue like any other organ, just like bone or lung or gut. People tend to think of the brain as this like fancy supercomputer, which it is, I don't argue. Um, but they tend to forget that it's not just a computer, it's an actual living piece of tissue that needs to be taken care of and remodeled. Um, so in the bone we have cells that build the bone and cells that take it away and you have to constantly communicate between these two, otherwise you get osteoporosis or you get osteopetrosis. And similarly, in the brain, we know that there are neurons that are constantly making synapses, and we have these cells called microglia, the phagocytes that take synapses away. Um, this is oversimplified, but just to make the point that communication has to happen in the brain as well. And the immune system is one of the major ways that this happens. So um, we tend to think of it as good or bad, but really it's a system of keeping things in balance. And you can have too much of a good thing or not enough. And we want to understand from the perspective of the immune system and brain development how this balance is altered. And why should a psychiatrist care about this? Well, there's plenty of evidence that the immune system is involved in a variety of psychiatric diseases, probably many of them. Um, we just don't have a good understanding of how. So autism, depression, and schizophrenia have all been proposed to have immune triggers. And I want to focus for a few slides on schizophrenia because I think that's where the data is most um, comprehensive from the epidemiology to the genetics to the functional data.
Um, so it's been known for a long time that there is a progressive loss of cortical gray matter, particularly in the um, brain regions that are relevant to the symptoms of schizophrenia, um, with just after the prodrome and with the onset of disease. Um, this is just one meta-analysis of that finding. And there's also a fair amount of evidence, although this is more tricky, that there are fewer dendritic spines, i.e. fewer synapses in schizophrenia. This is just one example where they're counting synapses. Again, if you think back to the Hootenlocker where we were looking at a um, I forget what the name of the stain was, but it's sort of a chemical stain that makes synapses light up a little bit. We now have much better ways to count synapses. We can count the different types. Um, we can count their size and shape. Um, and this group found that there are fewer synapses in the brains of schizophrenic patients in certain brain regions, um, but it tends to be the smaller, weaker ones that are missing. Um, which raises the question of, well, which kinds of synapses are lost? Is it the healthy, stable ones, or is it the ones that um, haven't stabilized yet? So there's gray matter thinning, there's synapse lost. There's also data, epidemiologic data, that um, immune processes can affect um, your risk of developing schizophrenia. So we know that schizophrenia is very highly heritable, more than 80% heritable, and yet um, there are triggers that seem to bring on the disease. And one way we know that is because the onset is different in age between males and females. So we know there's something about the environment, be it hormonal, environmental, or other, that can trigger that pre-existing genetic predisposition. Um, and this study found, I'm sorry, I have a little trouble seeing my own slides here, but that there's a 2.25 fold increased risk of schizophrenia um, when you combine two risk factors, which is hospitalization um, and I believe autoimmune disease. So two completely different types of immune triggers um, that seem to be correlated with the onset of schizophrenia. We also have evidence from genetics, right? So this is a very famous 108 loci paper, which I hope everybody knows, um, the biggest genetic study of schizophrenia so far. Um, and you'll see that of all the genes that are associated with schizophrenia in this very large study, the very highest peak on the Manhattan plot is the MHC locus. This is a big locus, has several hundred immune-related genes on it. Small interesting tidbit, it turns out that the MHC locus is largely borrowed from Neanderthals. So I guess when humans um, intermixed with Neanderthals, they acquired a lot of the immune genes that help protect us against disease. Um, so the MHC locus pops up a lot, so much that I sometimes wonder whether it's an artifact or a correlation. But nonetheless, it is the strongest signal in this genetic study of schizophrenia, which really tells us we should be thinking about how the immune system is involved in this disorder. And one very exciting study that came out a year or two ago found one gene in this MHC locus called C4, which is complement. It's a part of the complement system, which is the, um, I, if you learned about it in medical school, the MAC attack complex that tags onto bad things and then targets those things for destruction. And they showed that the more activity you have of the C4 gene, the more likely you are to have schizophrenia. So this was a pretty robust, um, very carefully done study. And what's exciting about it is that there's a fair amount of data already that this same innate immune pathway, the complement system, um, may be involved in synaptic pruning. So in work from Beth Stevens' lab, what I'm showing you here is a single microglial cell. So these are these phagocytes um, that I told you about that eat things in the brain. You'll hear a lot more about microglia later. A single microglial cell here is shown um, engulfing synaptic material. Material. And Beth's group showed that if you knock out the complement pathway in mice, they are less able to engulf synaptic material. So all of these data, ranging all the way from the epidemiology um, to the genetics to the functional work that, of course, we can only do in animals, suggest that indeed there's something going on with synaptic pruning and the immune system that might be relevant to schizophrenia. Um, and by no means do I say that this is all there is to it. I think there's a lot more we need to understand. Um, but it's a hint that we might um, want to go in this direction as basic scientists. So again, um, in the third part of the talk, I want to talk um, about some of the work from our own lab and how it fits in with this bigger picture. Um, and this work will be focused on glial cells because these are the cells that transmit immune signals from the periphery to the brain. So here, I have images of my two favorite glial cells. So again, glia make up half the brain, neurons are half, the other half um, is um, 
glial cells, which include astrocytes, microglia, and oligodendrocytes. Those are the cells that myelinate or wrap the neurons. And astrocytes, um, glia, by the way, means glue, although people in the glia field argue about whether it's glue or putty, which I don't know why that would matter, but it's German for putty, not glue. Um, and glue, of course, if you call something glue, no one's going to want to study it because that sounds super boring. Um, and for a long time, they were not studied, and yet they're everywhere. They're a ubiquitous part of the brain. And one beautiful thing about astrocytes, these are the structural glia of the brain. You can see they have so many fine processes, and that's because each of these processes is intimately associated with the cell. So they kind of infiltrate themselves all throughout the brain. Um, they fill up space, and they're intimately connected with neurons. You can see one neuron here um, and one astrocyte, but really these astrocytes are tiling the entire brain. And so on the other hand, we have microglia. So microglia are the professional phagocytes that I told you about. Here's a movie that we got in our lab in collaboration with um, Kira Piscanzer, who's across the hall from me, and you can see that these two microglial cells, here's one, here's the other, their cell bodies are not moving, but their processes, their little arms, are constantly moving all the time. Um, this process, which is called surveillance, was first discovered in 2005, and is very exciting because it suggests that these cells are not sitting there, they're actually doing something. What? what yeah. Oh, good question. I think the whole movie is 30 minutes, so I've sped it up. Um, but the people that first did this um, calculated that the entire brain is surveyed by a microglia every two to three hours. So you could imagine it wouldn't take very long if something bad happens over here for a microglial cell to sense it and start reacting. So um, one thing that we want to understand is how these two cell types are communicating with one another and with neurons to keep synapses in balance. I'm going to take a brief break here. This is in honor of my colleague and mentor, Ben Barris, who died uh, December 27th. And Ben had a tradition of stopping in the middle of all of his talks. <laughs> and he knew he had a captive audience and everybody was paying attention. And then he would launch off into whatever he felt was important to talk about at that time. So Ben, as many of you may know, was uh, transgender. He transitioned from female to male when he was 42 or 44. And ever since that time, he became a very powerful advocate for women science and so he would frequently stop his talks um, to talk about um, issues like you know female trainees being sexually harassed at meetings or the fact that there weren't equal opportunities for women women in science he once gave a talk when my daughter was six weeks old um, where he showed pictures of his trainees and their babies and how they had great faculty positions and look what a cute baby they had and and that had a huge impact on me I don't know if I would be where I am today if I hadn't had that inspiration to keep going as a scientist and not feel like my career was over so we're very grateful to Ben, and in addition to all of that, he was a phenomenal glial biologist. He is probably the person more than anybody that has made glia um, part of the conversation in neuroscience, and all the work that I told you about with complements and many, many other things were started in Ben's lab, so we miss him very much. Okay, and he's also an author on our paper, by the way, which I'll be telling you about now. So <clears throat> in this study, I'll be telling you about how astrocytes, the structural support glia of the brain, and microglia, which are the phagocytes of the brain, communicate with one another via an immune cue called interleukin-33 um, to regulate the number of neuronal synapses. Um, this is work that's done in collaboration with my husband, the immunologist that Susan mentioned, um, and I'll tell you more about how that all fits together in a bit. So first I want to tell you how we got into this story. I didn't start out as a microglial biologist. I didn't know that much about them, to be honest. Um, I was studying astrocytes. I had a very simple question. Are astrocytes all the same everywhere? This was my postdoctoral work. Or are they different in different parts of the brain? Um, and so we did an experiment where we took the brain of a mouse. We labeled all of its astrocytes with a genetic tool. And then we sorted out interesting brain regions, cortex, striatum, thalamus, hippocampus, and asked whether there were genes that were different among the astrocytes in those different regions. If something is uh, boring and kind of ubiquitous, then it shouldn't be different. But if something is unique to all those very unique circuits that are present throughout the brain, then we might identify it that way. This was work that was um, the, all of the heavy lifting in bioinformatics was done by Kevin Kelly, who um, was a postdoc in my lab last year and is now a fourth year medical student. MSTP student. Um, and 
here's one gene, um, a top candidate gene that came out of the screen. It's called interleukin-33. Um, it was detected in the thalamus, but not in most other brain regions at the time that we were looking. And it's also very highly expressed in the spinal cord. So these two features, the fact that it's expressed in astrocytes, but not other cells, and that it's expressed differently in different parts of the brain, made us want to follow up to figure out what this gene was doing. Um, but that's not the only reason, because in science, it's always a combination of what's possible and what's um, interesting. And in this case, we had the strong possibility to do these experiments. So there's a review about interleukin-33, and you'll notice this person is not me. Um, that is my collaborator and husband, as I mentioned. He was at that time writing a review about this gene, interleukin-33, and I was at a meeting, and I was looking at my data, and I started to text him. I was like, wow, your gene is the top candidate in my cell type. How interesting is that? And so, <laughs> and you know, for that reason, and because we had all of the tools to really study this question carefully, um, we decided to try to figure out why this immune molecule is being expressed in the normal developing brain. Um, it was already known around that time, and in many other tissues in the body as well as the brain, that this is an immune cue that helps tissues to repair themselves after damage, including in spinal cord injury. I'm very interested in the future in understanding traumatic brain injury. I think that's one of the major challenges in psychiatry, and I think that's an area um, as psychiatrists that we really have to think about, like, how many um, types of insults are correlated with suicide, and isn't suicide one of the major things we want to understand? But I digress. Um, anyways, interleukin-33 was first described as an alarmin. It's an immune molecule that spills out of cells when they've been damaged, and it recruits a response that helps to repair that tissue. And we wanted to understand why is it expressed in the normal developing brain, and does it have a role even outside of the context of injury or stress or damage? And so we started to look at where this molecule was expressed. Um, here's an example of the spinal cord, which is a very nice, simple tissue and organized in a way so that the synapses are on the inside and the white matter tracts are on the outside. And so you can see right away when you look at the spinal cord, we're labeling interleukin-33 with this blue dye. Um, it's a genetic label. Um, that Interleukin-33 is only expressed where the synapses are. So already we had a clue that this is something important for synapses, or at least only in the areas where synapses existed. Um, this is Ilya, who um, did a lot of the work related to this project. Ilya has also looked in other ways using uh, fluorescent genetic markers. You can see all of this green, these are astrocytes. They are everywhere in the brain and spinal cord. And in the gray matter, they have this shape that allows them to interact with synapses. In the white matter, they have this long string shape that fits them in between the myelinating axon tracts. And again, interleukin-33 labeled in red is only expressed near synapses. So we looked at this in more detail. The first place that we discovered this cue was in the thalamus, as I told you. And the thalamus, I'll tell you more about later, is a key relay region of the brain. Here it is. Um, what's cool about the thalamus is that all the different inputs from vision and audition, eh, is, that, is that a word, audition? <laughs> Auditory inputs, visual inputs, and sensory inputs. In the mouse, they start whisking their whiskers when they're about five days old, and one of the first places that you see interleukin-33 is in the whisker nucleus of the thalamus. Um, and what was really interesting, this um, in the dotted line is the visual nucleus. This is where all the eye inputs come in, and we notice that right when the eyes are opening, there's this really sharp increase in the expression of this gene, which is quantified here. So this suggested it to us that the astrocytes are not just expressing this gene, but that they can sense synaptic input in some way, and they're only turning it on when synapses are maturing in a particular way. And so Elliot, who was a great Berkeley undergraduate, um, working in the lab a couple of summers ago, decided to do an experiment where we test whether this is really true or whether it's just a coincidence. So here again is the whisker nucleus, and here is the visual nucleus where the eye inputs are coming in. Um, preparation, this is not, this is kind of a gross experiment, so I apologize in advance. We removed the visual inputs by enucleation, um, which is a nice way of saying we had to remove their eyes. Um, and look to see whether this gene is still expressed, and it was not. So in other words, the synapses that are coming from the eyes into the visual thalamus are required for this gene to be turned on during development, and that is quantified here. Whereas raising the mice in complete darkness did not do this. So we're still trying to understand what is it about these circuits that's turning on this immune cue in astrocytes.
and only in the ones that are near synapses. Um, and first of all, we also wanted to answer the question of who's it talking to? And in the next part, I want to tell you that it's mostly communicating with microglial cells in the brain, the cells that eat synapses. Um, how do we know this? So the interleukin-33 molecule signals via a receptor um, called ST2. Um, I didn't go into that in the previous slide, but basically we have the molecule coming from one cell and talking to the receptor in another cell. And if it doesn't have that receptor, the cell doesn't know that it's around. And so we look to see where these receptors are expressed, and they're pretty much only expressed on microglial cells in the brain, which kind of makes sense. These are the immune cells of the brain. Um, and so we wanted to understand why this molecule is talking to microglia and how it affects the way microglia behave. Um, what we do a lot in our lab is to look at the genes expressed by different cell types. Um, this, I won't go into detail, but it's just a plot. It's a way that we use to isolate cells in the brain called flow cytometry. We can isolate microglia, and we can isolate astrocytes. And then we can compare what happens when you do that for mice that are completely lacking this immune cue. And the astrocytes, as it turns out, could care less. So even though they're the ones expressing this molecule, they don't really care whether it's expressed or not. Their genes pretty much stay the same whether it's there or not. Whereas the microglia are very, very strikingly altered when we get rid of this immune cue. Um, and the things that are altered, this is a heat map, which is just a way of summarizing the genes that are different in two populations. The genes that are altered, to sum it up, are immune genes. And what's most interesting to me about this is that it's not the knockout microglia. It's not the microglia lacking the signal that are interesting. It's the wild types that are interesting, which means that these immune pathways are functioning in normal brain development, and when we get rid of this immune cue, the whole system kind of shuts down. So these microglia are doing something. Um, they're doing something important, and they're using the immune system to do that thing. When we get rid of this immune signal, um, everything becomes more quiescent, so they're less able to do the things that they do well. So this is the biggest take-home point, if I could make you remember one thing is that the immune system is doing good things in brain development. It's necessary for normal brain development. And if we get rid of these critical immune cues, um, the brain is not able to remodel in the way that it needs to. And so we wanted to understand more oops, I'm going backwards, about what microglia um, are doing that's different when we get rid of this cue. So here's a I don't really need to show you a movie, but it's nice, so I thought I would show it. Here's a picture of several microglial cells labeled with a genetic label and synapses. This is not the whole synapse, it's just the postsynaptic side labeled with a marker called PSD95. You can see they're everywhere, like stars in the sky. We use some programs to mask and get rid of all the synapses that are outside of the microglial cell to really see if this, what people have been proposing, that microglia prune synapses, that they eat synapses, to see if that's really true. Um, and here's what this looks like. So you can see the microglia. We're zooming in on one of them. We're masking all the synapses that are not inside the microglia. And now you can see the cell nucleus, and you can see synaptic proteins sitting inside of this microglial cell. Um, <clears throat> this is not hard to find. It happens. Um, we can look many different ways and see this. Um, I will point out that we don't know what this means. We don't know, are they eating a living synapse? Are they eating synaptic debris that's spilled out of a, a cell that doesn't need it anymore? The word pruning tends to imply that it's like a like a gardener cutting a lemon off of a tree, and the truth is we don't really know. Is this pruning? Is this engulfment? Um, and that's one thing that we're interested in understanding. But back to the point, um, now that we can quantify whether microglia eat pieces of synapses, we can quantify whether this immune signal, interleukin-33, affects that process. And here's a picture of a microglia and the synapses that we can count inside. And indeed, when we get rid of this immune signal in a mouse that's lacking interleukin-33, we see less synapse engulfment by microglia. And of course, we want to understand in science always whether we can drive the system both ways. Um, this is Greg Chin, who's a very talented technician in the lab. And what Greg started doing was injecting very tiny amounts of this immune cue, interleukin-33, directly into brain tissue. Here again, you can see the microglial cell. One of the first things we notice is that the microglia are clearly responding to this signal. They get fat um, and hypertrophied. And this is classically what happens when these microglial cells are activated. It's something that we often see in disease and pathology, and people usually think that that means they're doing something bad. But again, take home point, that's not necessarily true. In this case, they've been 
um, stimulated by this immune cue to eat more synapses. And you can see that there are a lot more synaptic puncta inside of the microglial cell when we give interleukin-33, and that's quantified here. Um, and finally, the big question, right? If this is a cue that um, is necessary for microglia to eat synapses, and if you have too much of it and they eat too many synapses, are there different numbers of synapses in the brain? So in this experiment, we're counting synapses um, using some of the techniques that other people have used that I've showed you. We have a marker that marks the presynaptic side, and we have a marker that marks the postsynaptic side in blue and red. And anywhere that those overlap, we can um, estimate that that's a synaptic contact. When we inject interleukin-33, we can see a dramatic decrease in the number of synapses in that region of the brain. This is about a two-fold decrease. And importantly, if we inject the same thing into a mouse that can't sense interleukin-33 in its microglia, in other words, we've removed the receptor from the microglia, we can see a significant rescue of this process. And that's quantified here. So we inject this immune cue. There's a huge loss of synapses within a day. Um, we get rid of the receptor from microglia, and there's a significant rescue, although it's not complete. Um, and of course, this leads us to think about whether this could be relevant to diseases where synapses are lost. Um, could signals like this, in the case of aberrant immune activation, lead to too much pruning of synapses, too much synaptic loss? This is most relevant, of course, to neurodegenerative diseases, but um, those of us interested in psychiatric diseases have to think about schizophrenia um, and other diseases where synapses are lost. Um, autism is a more complicated question as to what's going on there. So. Again, there are synapses lost, and I just want to briefly, this is the last data portion of the, of the talk, and I think I might end a little bit early. Um, what happens to the neurons in the system? So we've shown that this interleukin-33, this immune cue is coming from astrocytes, that it's good, that it makes microglia do the things that they're supposed to do, which is to eat synapses. If there's too much of it, you can get synapse loss. So what about the neurons? These are the ones that are making the synapses, and of course, these are the ones that are ultimately responsible for brain function. Um, so I want to show a little bit of data about one region where we've looked at this, which is the thalamus. So I already told you that the thalamus is this important sensory motor integration part of the brain, where inputs from all these different different sensory systems are mixing up, talking to one another, and communicating with the cortex. Um, the thalamus is really important for synchronizing brain oscillations. So people have think a lot about delta oscillations and gamma, um, delta slow wave sleep. Uh, all of these brain oscillations are really tuned and synchronized via the thalamus. And one very pathologic type of brain oscillation, which is seizures, um, is also involving thalamic synchrony. And my collaborator, Jean Paz, who helped us to do these experiments, has shown that if you abort um, oscillations within the thalamus, you can abort a seizure. In other words, this is a really key um, brain region for integrating information. So Francis Cho, who's a graduate student in John's lab, is able to measure these oscillations right within the thalamus so she can cut a slice um, from a mouse brain with the thalamus in it. And then here's a picture of what this actually looks like. This is the thalamus with all these different subregions. This is a stimulating electrode that you can stick in the internal capsule, which kind of mimics what happens when the cortex talks to the thalamus. So you can put a little electric pulse and you can basically set up these little oscillations in the thalamus. And here I always call this a fork, but I think it's called called a multi-electrode something something. It's got 16 little prongs, and each one of these can sense these oscillations. And here's a picture. And so we focus on this region, which is the thalamus, to understand um, what's happening with this one uh, very critical brain circuit. Here's a picture of what that looks like. You've got see a diagram of the fork here. Um, and when you stimulate, you see these little so these little bursts of activity, which is these oscillations being set up within the thalamus. And what we found is that if we do this experiment in mice that are lacking this immune signal, um, the number of oscillations goes up. In other words, this circuit is hyperactive, it's hyperexcitable, and with just a little trigger, it cycles more. This, of course, makes us really, really curious to understand whether um, it's altered in epilepsy, and that's something we want to look at. Um, and of course, there's many things that can make a circuit hyperexcitable, as we know, like too much neurotransmitter and so forth. In this case, we think what is the relevant thing that's going on is that there's just too many synapses. So we can 
patch a single neuron in the thalamus and estimate the number of synapses that that neuron has. And Francis found that there was a significant increase in the number of excitatory synapses in this brain region. Um, and just to briefly touch on another brain region where this is important as well, John Miller, who was one of the first people to work on this project, was in the lab for two years, um, counted synapses. Now we're doing it in a different way by counting spots. You can see that each of these red spots is a afferent synapse synapsing onto a spinal motor neuron. And what John found is that, again, there's too many synapses in this other region of the brain, the spinal cord. If we conditionally get rid of the interleukin-33 signal just from the astrocytes, or if we get rid of its receptor. Um, it's not just excitatory synapses. Inhibitory ones are also altered. And so we're trying to understand how all these synaptic changes are leading to changes in behavior. Um, one thing that we do know, and this is interesting because we initially started these experiments, we wanted to test prepulse inhibition, which is a very well-known endophenotype associated with schizophrenia. It's when you pay a pulse um, and then you check for suppression of response to a pulse that comes shortly thereafter. Um, and it's a startle response, which I can demonstrate for you. You play a loud sound and the mouse goes like this. Okay, so it's a whole brain, um, it's a whole brain reflex response to a loud sound. And it involves these motor neurons in the brain stem and the spinal cord. And what we found is that interleukin-33 deficient mice have a significantly impaired startle response. So we couldn't test prepulse inhibition because the startle was already deficient. Um, and we don't know exactly what this means. We haven't tested things like, you know, ultrasonic vocalizations or marble bearing, the things that people tend to study when they're um, interested in psychiatric disease. And that's in part because of a bias of mine. I just don't believe that those things in mice are really relevant to the very complex dis disorders that we study, um, but they're important. Um, we know that there is something wrong um, with the circuits in this mouse in a way that affects their behavior. Oh, and by the way, these mice can hear normally, so it's not because they just can't hear the pulse. We actually anesthetized a whole group of mice and brought them over here to the department that can test brainstem auditory ref reflexes, and we checked out that their hearing was normal. So this is our hypothesis, that this immune cue coming from astrocytes drive microglial engulfment, that that engulfment is critical to maintain the correct number of synapses in the brain, and that that's important for behavior. Um, and just briefly, I want to show you one or two examples of the directions that my lab is taking to understand this process further. First of all, we know already that this is a phenomenon that's relevant to all kinds of different brain regions. Um, and one brain region that's been very interesting from a psychiatric perspective, as well as others, is the hippocampus. Um, it's where memories are first encoded in the brain. And we know that there are many abnormalities in dendritic spines um, in the hippocampus in many mouse models of disease, including fragile X syndrome and others. Sophie, who's a graduate student in the lab, decided to study the effects of this immune cue, interleukin-33, in determining the number of dendritic spines in the hippocampus. Here's an image of a single neuronal dendrite with some of the spines. And surprisingly, what Fee found is that Instead of having more spines in the hippocampus, which is what we see in the thalamus and the spinal cord, interleukin-33 deficient mice have fewer dendritic spines. So again, um, this is when we see a confusing result or something that makes no sense, this is typically a hint that there's something interesting there. And so we want to understand how the same immune signal in two different brain regions could be causing opposing effects. And one thing that we think is going on is that this immune cue only turns on in the hippocampus when it's the animal's already an adult. So there are differences in the way in which synapses form during development and the way that synapses reform um, in adult animals. But one thing that's cool about the hippocampus is that we know a lot about what affects its function. And we know um, and have known for some time that environmental enrichment can very robustly drive hippocampal activity and can drive the birth of new neurons in the hippocampus. This is an example of an environmentally enriched um, animal cage. So typically the animals live in a cage, five to a cage. Um, they have a couple of things to do, but the food is very boring and it's really not that cool. And so when we say that you know mice are not very smart, it's really our fault for not giving them the types of enrichment that they need to develop their intelligence. So Fee devised this uh, cage here, which is commonly used for these types of experiments. It's got little running tubes and lots of houses and things to chew on, things to eat, and things to do. And then every few days, he'll go in and switch it all around so that they can learn a new thing, kind of like how we would set up a high-quality daycare. 
And, and then he studied the effect of environmental enrichment on the expression of interleukin-33 in the hippocampus. Um, another small caveat, in the hippocampus, interleukin-33 is expressed by neurons, not just by astrocytes. And what you can see here is that the number of neurons expressing interleukin-33 goes way up when we environmentally enrich the animals. So again, this is evidence that this immune cue is responsive to what's going on in the environment, and not just bad things like an infection or an inflammatory response, but good things such as the amount of environmental enrichment that you have. And so it's interesting to think about how um, social deprivation, social stress, all of these different paradigms that are relevant to the diseases that we care about would affect um, innate immune signaling in the brain. Um, and importantly, we know that glia are the first responders to stress. So whenever something bad happens to the brain, you can cut sections of it and you can see gliosis. The glia get fat, they get upset. Um, and because we know that they're the first responders to stress, it's really important to understand how these signals that are playing good roles during development could, bl could play bad or pathologic roles in the context of um, stress or trauma. So finally, just to end with um, one quick future direction and thoughts about the direction that we want to go to, I cannot conclude this talk without mentioning maternal immune activation. Um, this is one of the biggest, most major models that's been used to study the role of the immune system in brain development. And it involves the fact that if you inject um, a substance that looks a little bit like a virus to the immune system in the middle of gestation, so this would be second trimester in humans, it's embryonic day 14 in the mouse, and then you follow the mice into adulthood. They have all kinds of behavioral abnormalities, some of the ones that I was sort of making, not making fun of, but pointing out to you earlier, things like marble burying and whether they squeak enough or not and this sort of thing. And so it's been proposed that a maternal, maternal immune activation is a model for autism, um, but if you read this review, um, one of the best reviews on this topic, where you can see the effects of maternal immune activation. In fact, it can cause almost everything, ranging from neurodegenerative disease to schizophrenia to autism to cerebral palsy to death. So clearly, in between death and schizophrenia, there's a wide array of things that we need to understand. Why would an immune signal possibly cause so many different pathologies? And one thing that we really need to understand is what's exactly happening to the cells and circuits involved. Um, and a very exciting recent study found that when maternal immune activation happens, the T cells in the mother, so these are cells that are not in the baby at all, but they are lymphocytes that live in the mother's immune system, that these cells churn out huge amounts of a cytokine. So just like interleukin-33 is a cytokine, this is a cytokine coming from lymphocytes, the immune cells of the mother, and this, this IL-17 crosses the placenta into the baby and can be causative for some of these behavioral abnormalities that we see in MIA. So again, I would point out that this type of a stimulus is way, way, way too much of a good thing. Um, typically, the brain is using these signals in a good way, and if you really, really drive the system by putting this whopping amount of this virus, you can understand a little bit about how these things could go wrong. And so we're interested, this is in collaboration with our Malofsky's lab, to understand what are these lymphocytes doing under normal conditions. So most cytokines, most of these immune signals are not being made by astrocytes. They're being made by these little round cells, which are the professional cytokine makers of the immune system. They live all over the body, and we're finding that they also live um, in the developing brain. Um, all over the body, these cells talk to the macrophages in that tissue and promote the tissue turnover. So anytime a tissue needs to be cleaned up or remodeled, um, macrophages are the ones that do it. And we're wondering if brain lymphocytes might talk to brain microglia to promote the remodeling of brain synapses. And one of the reasons it's an exciting time to do this kind of work is because people have recently discovered that the brain is not as immune privileged as we thought. And in fact, there are lymphocytes sitting in the brain in a place where we never thought to look. So for a long time, people would take the brain out of the skull, they would section it, they would look at it, they would say there's no lymphocytes in the brain. The only immune cell in the brain is microglia and it doesn't do that much, blah, blah, blah. So all that time, they were throwing away the important part, which is the skull cap. So if you take off the skull cap of a mouse's brain and then look at the dura mater, um, there are all kinds of lymphocytes stuck to the dura mater of the brain, and those lymphocytes can secrete their immune signals into the cerebral spinal fluid, which is constantly circulating through the brain. Um, and here's a picture of one of these lymphocytes populations. It's called an ILC2, 
um, and it's labeled in red. And this is the central venous sinus. They like to hang out near the vessels. Um, and there's plenty of them in the brain um, with the potential to secrete cytokines into the meninges um, and into the cerebrospinal fluid. Um, and we notice that they populate the brain meninges right around the time where all of these synaptic remodeling events are happening. Um, so during this critical developmental window where the brain is forming, when the symptoms of schizophrenia will start to show up, um, we see that these lymphocytes are there. Um, we want to understand more about what types of immune signals that they are producing and how they could be helping the microglia to do what they do. Um, so I want to thank my lab. I think this picture is not quite up to date, um, but all the people who did the work, whose pictures I tried to show as I was going along, I want to thank my collaborators, who I also mentioned as we were going along, um, and my funding sources. And I'm happy to take any questions. Well, circulating cytokines in the mice as opposed to the maternal immune activation model. Correct. In the, in the, if you're, I guess mice should be able to model schizophrenia to test it well, which is difficult. But yeah. I mean, definitely. So, for example, things like IL-6, right? The main cell that, ex the only cell that expresses the IL-6 receptor in the brain is microglia. Um, and if you inject IL-6 or if you inject a stimulus like LPS that triggers activation, you will clearly see microglia in the brain responding. Um, I think what we don't look enough at is what exactly they're doing differently, um, not just what shape they are. But absolutely, there's no question that microglia can respond to circulating cytokines. And so that's probably, one would imagine, the reason why infections could activate certain um, behavioral pathologies. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's a great question. So IL-33 is thought to act very locally. Um, so it's acting at the site at which it's produced. And as far as we know, it's expressed at such high levels and it keeps going up and up and up, and it tends not to go down again. So I would be surprised if it's regulated by peripheral immune cues, but I think it's very likely that its receptor um, will be responsive to peripheral immune cues. So the ability of microglia to sense it and respond to it um, um, can be dynamically regulated by the other signals. So microglia can be thought of as these central processing units that are integrating information, not just from the local astrocytes, but from circulating cytokines, um, from all kinds of outside forces, and then integrating it to a final response. They are the ones ultimately who have to decide, decide what to do in terms of eating more or fewer synapses. So that's where I would tend to look. Yes. Well, from last I heard, there is not an increased incidence of autism, so I think that's a, a big discussion. I mean, we've heard all kinds of speculation about hot spots in Silicon Valley and um, genetics interacting, um, possibilities that there are things in the environment that we're not measuring um, that might act as immune mimics, right? So some kind of plastic or additive or toxin that tricks the immune system into thinking that it needs to be hyperactive. Those are all speculations, but I guess I would first start by really wanting to understand the epidemiology as to whether the incidence is going up or not. And I know that's very controversial. Yes, Judy. Judy. 
For sure. I mean, and with those types of questions, I would defer to somebody like you because I can, I can read a study that says, oh, who knew the cerebellum is involved in schizophrenia? And I'm like, well, okay, maybe. So I would really want to talk to the expert in that area who can really tell me, okay, no, this one really is involved. Um, ignore those other ones because I, you know. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> That's great. No, I mean, the thalamus is very, very interesting. People have started to study the regions of the thalamus, not just that are integrating sensory information that is easier to study, but the more complicated things. So the connections between the thalamus and prefrontal cortex are becoming more and more well understood. They're much more complicated than what I presented in terms of the simple sensory systems, but absolutely there's a huge connection between prefrontal cortex and thalamus, which people are beginning to study in detail in mice. And that, by the way, is compromised in people's schizophrenia. So we've got sort of a nice double dissociation. Yes. Um, the challenge for basic scientists is to really do the careful immunology, the careful circuit analysis, and the careful physiology um, to bring it all together. It's very hard to find groups that are spanning that range. I think one of the great things about UCSF is that it's so collaborative. I think no one group can do this kind of work well. Um, and translating to human things involves talking to people that are thinking about the human brain. Um, we tend to forget that there are things besides mouse brains. It's kind of scary to think about neuroscience and how 99% of what we know is about C57 black 6 mice, um, which are a strain of mouse from a lab in the East Coast, and we really need to cross-correlate these things by studying other organisms and humans to the extent that we can. Psychotherapy supervisor is sitting in the room. <laughs> I'm trying hard to just balance the things I do in the lab and um, with the things I do in the clinic in a way that um, is fair to my patients. Um, and I would like to think that having an understanding of brain complexity um, would make me more um, appreciative of. Um, so, Marty, your question is whether this work informs the work that I do with patients, or did I oversimplify your question? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think the one thing I would say um, as a metaphor is that often in psychotherapy it feels as if um, one is not making progress, and that can seem that way for long stretches of time. Um, and as I showed in the slide in the very beginning, which I will go back to just for reference, um, what can look static and unchanging is actually um, a very dynamic process. So, again... Maybe instead of using a metaphor from HIV, I should have used a metaphor from our own work. Let's see if this shows up again. Um, what can look static, in other words, nothing happening, nothing happening, nothing happening, really reflects a very dynamic underlying process. Um, it can help me to remain engaged in the work that I'm doing. Um, and I think, um, as with all psychiatric disease, I think it's important to visualize it as a process that um, 
that the brain is trying to heal itself, that it's not just a downhill slope, um, but it's um, an energetic and very dynamic process that we can try to intervene in multiple ways by preventing the downs, by increasing the ups. Um, so that's one way I might think about it. Oh, good. I answered it right. <laughs> Thanks, Marty. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you.